All right, well, it's two o'clock and let's get started. Thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar, Building an Engineering Career, Perspectives from ADB's Women Engineers. I am so excited to celebrate International Women in Engineering Day with you all. So since we are joined by both internal and external people from ABB uh, and beyond, I'm gonna do a very brief high level overview of um, ABB. So ABB is a global technology company. We lead in power and automation. We have approximately 144,000 employees worldwide present in 100 different countries. And our four main areas of business are electrification, industrial automation, motion, and robotics and discrete automation. And we're very lucky to have panelists representing all of these business areas. Since I know we have many uh, students and recent graduates on the line, I just wanna quickly talk about the LEAD Early Career Programs. Our LEAD Early Career Programs are a two-year rotational program for recent college graduates. So anyone who's on the line who maybe is graduating next December or next May, check out the LEAD program online. It's an opportunity to explore all the different uh, businesses at ABB and try out different job functions and different roles. And then if there are any current students, ABB also offers internships uh, for undergraduates, graduates, and doctoral students in spring, summer, and fall. Um, our formal uh, summer internship program will be opening applications this August, so that's very soon. So if you're interested in that, check it out. All right, and with that, I'm excited to introduce today's panelists. They span a wide range of occupations with it within ABB um, and different areas of the, the businesses and different um, career stages. So first, my name is Audrey and I'm going to be the moderator today. I am actually a member of the LEAD Engineering Early Career Program. Um, I think someone's mic might be on, so if we can make sure that those are not on and I'll continue. So our first panelist is Sarah Acker. She's the America's hub manager for the Electrification Smart Power and Smart Buildings Division. We have Jamie Arnold, who's the VP of Supply Chain Management for the Mechanical Power Transmission Division. We have Dr. Sherkat Peterson. She's the Healthcare Global Business Development and Strategy Manager for the Robotics and Discrete Automation Business. We have Candida Lopez. She's a project manager within the Electrification Distribution Solutions Division. And finally, last but not least, we have Rita Patel. She's an electrical systems engineer within the Industrial Automation Energy Industries Division. Thank you all so much for joining our discussion today. So Thank I'm you. I'm gonna start. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I'll start um, with, uh, a basic question. I, I read out all of your titles, but I'd love if you could each um, explain what those mean, what are your roles, and what are your responsibilities. So, Sarah, I'll start with you. Sure. Right. So, as a hub manager, um, I'd say in one sentence, really to safely drive profitable, profitable growth for our business. Um, I have responsibility for, we have 10 manufacturing and services facilities. Uh, in North America and South America that support the smart power and smart uh, building businesses. And we really, you know, really doing this through um, the pillars of safety and quality and integrity, you know, making sure that those are the pillars. And then from there, delivering on, you know, the commitments to our customers and, you know, really just making sure that our customers are supported throughout the process. Great. And Jamie, would you tell us a little bit more about your role? Sure, so as in supply chain management, I'm responsible for making sure that our suppliers deliver high quality products to our plants on time. Um, we have six plants in the US and, and one in China that we support. And the main activity that we do is strategic sourcing. So for any given type of part, we look to understand the market and the cross drivers for the product the difference in cost in the different regions of the world and the suppliers that are capable of making our parts. And some of the key topics that we work on with our suppliers are compliance, making sure that they meet and exceed our requirements, um, risk management, 
cost savings, and then we work a lot with our suppliers to collaborate with R&D. Fantastic. And Shirkat, what about your role? Yeah, so for the healthcare business line, I'm responsible for our global strategy and business development. So this really is about interfacing with three key elements of the business. Um, the first being sort of the business line itself, really managing our global pipeline and our uh, technology portfolio. Um, there's a lot, also a lot of day-to-day -day customer engagement and really defining sort of how we go to market and what new products we need to develop as well. The second aspect is more from a marketing communications aspect. So I work quite closely with that team to sort of shape our brand, sort of refine our communication strategy and identify key markets that we want to penetrate. And the last is working closely with our sales team, really just to develop key messaging for our key customers, as well as defining how we should engage with those customers. Fantastic. And um, just pause, I'm going to pause for a second. Um, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box as we're going, um, and, and we'll answer those at the end. All right, so Candida, if you could please tell us about your role. So one of the unique things about my role as a project manager is that it's the only role where you touch every part of a component from marketing, sales, manufacturing, delivery, and installation and commissioning. In project management, I see a project from wing to wing. I plan, organize, and oversee the project from project life cycle. So there are five phases for project management. We have the initiating phase, the planning phase, executing, monitoring and controlling, and lastly, closing of a project. And I'm responsible for ensuring my projects are on time, on budget, and within scope. In my role, I can change my organization's trajectory by increasing revenue, helping reduce costs, and maximizing efficiencies. This is what I do and what I'm responsible for in my role as a project manager. My role, in my role, I manage power distribution projects for commercial construction, like stadiums, distribution centers, amusement parks, hotels, hospitals, wastewater treatment plants, and data centers. I source the power that we all use every day. I power the world. Wow, that sounds fantastic, all the different aspects of project management. And Rena, the last question is for you, but I'm going to add, uh, alter the question a little bit. Uh, so for our audience, Rena just graduated from the LEAD Early Career Program, and she's now in her permanent role. So I would love to know what your permanent role is, and then also walk us through your experience in the LEAD Program and how that helps you uh, figure out where you wanted to end up. For sure. Um, so. Yes, as Audrey said, I just started my full-time role yesterday, so very freshly off the program. But um, in my full-time role as an electrical systems engineer, I'm helping support our electrical engineering operations team within the energy industries group with delivering electrical distribution uh, design. Uh, well, designing electrical distribution systems as well as delivering them um, for various customer projects. So that ranges from designing protection and control, doing electrical system studies, um, to working with factories on switchgear design, um, all of the above. And in terms of my experience within the LEAD program, um, I started the LEAD program in August of 2019 after I graduated with my electrical engineering degree. And in my first rotation, I was in Raleigh, North Carolina with our Smart Grid Solutions Group as an applications engineer. Um, and in that role, I was helping with business development and educating our potential customers about ABB's smart grid solutions and technologies. Um, my second rotation was with our electric vehicle charging infrastructure group as a project manager. Um, and in that role, and that was in Phoenix, Arizona, um, in that role, I was helping drive internal process uh, documentation and improvement projects, as well as uh, Salesforce development, um, along with managing some customer projects along the lines of what ABB is doing our electric vehicle chargers um, and uh, hey, then Lena, my, we're yeah. having a little hard time hearing you oh really is that better speak up or yeah okay yeah. oh yeah that's better I'll okay. to my face okay thank you blame me out um and then my so yeah that was my second rotation and then third rotation was with the 
Energy Industries Group as the electrical systems engineer. So now I've rolled off into that role full time. Sounds great. All right, so I'm going to bring this back to Sarah. So I have a, a couple questions for you. So first, um, America's Hub Manager to me as a, a person who just started a career that sounds like such a, a big responsibility. So I'm wondering, once you reach that level, then what are your goals? <laughs> <laughs> After this, whether that's, um, whether that's personal or for the business or anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I've learned, I think, over the last, you know, couple years, and, and, and I got this advice from a mentor who actually I was interviewing with for a job was make sure that you just take, take roles that are going to build upon experiences so you can take the next level role, right? And so for me, I mean, I'm, I mean, I've only been in this role a little over a year, year and a half. And, you know, I mean, I think this role is like, you know, probably three to five years, you know, we're doing a lot of integration between G and ABB. Um, we're doing a lot of product changes. Uh, again, some of the G products are being replaced by ABB products and vice versa. And we're actually building this hub. So before uh, the G acquisition, there were just two plants in this hub. And now there were originally 15 and now we've had to do some consolidation restructuring and now we're down to 10. Um, so there's just a ton of things to learn. And, you know, for me, my personal goal is just to learn as much as I can to build skills that I didn't have before so that, you know, when other opportunities do come up that, you know, I would be a good fit for those. That's great. And, and I'm wondering, it sounds very, um, business focused, so I'm wondering, can you speak to how your, your engineering background has helped what you're doing today and how it's affected that? So when I, when I originally joined, so I was part of the GE acquisition. When I originally joined GE, I joined a program similar to LEAD, so to what Rena was just talking about and yourself. Um, you know, and I think having, you know, a lot of small, good, needy projects and having a lot of leadership exposure and leadership training really helped me become just thirsty for learning. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I think every job you take or every class you take or, you know, every group you get involved in, you know, just figure out how you can learn and also, you know, how you can give back, right, and provide guidance. And you don't necessarily sure. have to look to someone who's above you, right? I mean, a lot of my mentors are even my peers, you know, just to get advice, get different points of view on, you know, how to do different things. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, Jamie, I have a, a similar question for you. Um, I was wondering if you could walk us through some of the highlights of your career and then, and then again, how that engineering background has affected your work today in supply chain management? Sure. So I started my career as a, a manufacturing engineer, and I worked in the automotive industry for a year or so before changing jobs to work for Reliance Electric. Um, I started with Reliance as a, a manufacturing engineer as well, and I've been with this same company for 25 years, although we've changed hands um, several times, and we became part of ABB in 2011 as part of the Baldor acquisition. Um, but after spending some time as a manufacturing engineer, I had an opportunity to move into applications engineering. And, you know, after working on the process that made the product, I really enjoyed that move into applications engineering where you could, I got to actually talk to customers and about how they're using those products and, and helping them select those products. And I did that for several different product lines in our in our gearing, enclosed gearing products for about nine years and was ready to move on to do something new. And there was an opportunity in product marketing. So I moved into that. Um, and that consisted of, you know, a lot of quoting some of those same products that I'd been an application engineer for. Um, also getting to go out and visit customers, see those applications in person, and do a lot of product training with our customers. And that really helped me understand better, you know, what's important to customers when they're making a buying decision. Um, and then in 2009, I had an opportunity to move into supply chain. And I spent a couple years at one of our plants as a buyer. 
before moving into more of a corporate role as a category manager. And I've been in this current role for about four years. Um, in terms of the, the second part of your question, how my engineering background has helped me prepare for this, I think one thing an engineering degree does for you is it's just a really solid foundation of analytical skills that you can really apply across a wide variety of things. Um, and in supply chain, you know, we're really the, the link between taking what engineering designs and the specifications that they create and finding someone in the market who can produce that product. So being able to, to read and understand, you know, the technical drawings and the specifications and help explain those to suppliers, as well as being able to go into a supplier and look at their process and understand the different steps in the process and how they're producing the parts, you know, it's really beneficial. Wow, yeah, it just sounds like it, it gave you a really um, a robust knowledge base that you could bring to anything that you did. That's Absolutely. great. Wow, so I'd like to move to Sherquette. So um, you very recently joined ABB, and in fact, I think you have maybe the, the more unique um, educational background. You actually have a, a bachelor's in chemistry and a PhD in uh, pharmaceutical sciences. So I was wondering, if, again, like Jamie, if you could um, take us through the highlights of of your career and then how it how it brought you to ABB doing this healthcare business. Yeah, um, sure. So for me, I would say my entire career is a highlight. To be honest with you, um, I'm the first yes. one in my <laughs> I'm the first one in my family to uh, get a to go to college and also to obtain a PhD. So um, for me, I would say more so there are defining moments within my career and that brought me to ABB. I would say the first is sort of my decision early on in eighth grade to basically uh, test into this medical high school, the only one in the country, to pursue a career within healthcare. Um, and so I would say the second would be sort of where I made the decision between two passions, either pursuing an MD or a PhD. Um, I, I worked for uh, Texas Heart Institute looking at ventricular uh, assist devices, and then I worked at Rice University right after my bachelor's degree um, to see if I loved sort of the research aspects or the medical aspects more and decided to pursue my PhD in pharmaceutical sciences. Um, so doing more drug discovery and development. And I would say the third step that sort of brought me here is really making a decision between industry and academia. So after my postdoc at Johns Hopkins, I made the decision to move into an industry role at Johnson & Johnson. Um, and I worked there for several years. Uh, before making the last defining decision to bring me here to ABB. Um, and part of the reason that brought me here to ABB is um, just like uh, Sarah mentioned, I'm a lifelong learner. I really love sort of the, have these diverse passions and I really like to embrace change. And so when I heard that we could build a healthcare business in a technical company, um, and pr particularly for robotics, where I feel the future of healthcare is quite bright there, I jumped on the opportunity. That's fantastic. And um, for, for those of you who don't know, this, this healthcare group that we have is um, very new. There's a, actually, maybe you could speak to it. What is it, Jerkett? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so our, I don't need to do this. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so our healthcare business, as um, Audrey mentioned, is pretty new. We decided uh, last year uh, to make this jump into healthcare by building out our um, um, research institute and development institute within the Texas Medical Center. But over, I would say over the last six to eight months, this business has expanded greatly into other regions like China and Australia and Japan. So it really is growing exponentially um, and uh, the, the future for healthcare seems quite bright. Fantastic. So what are you most excited about with moving forward, whether that's personal career stuff or with, with the healthcare group? I, if I'm being honest, I'm excited about every single aspect of it. 
Um, I, I think <laughs> I think one of the things I've enjoyed uh, thus far is really working in a diverse team. So our team is packed with engineers, with uh, scientists, with people from very diverse backgrounds. Um, and so I'm a strong believer that great minds think differently. Um, so I think sort of working with this team that's been so diverse, I've seen such a great passion and a drive to succeed uh, globally from all of our different healthcare teams. Um, and then the second part I would say is really taking sort of those great mind and novel ideas and seeing how they can develop into robotic solutions for healthcare. So I've seen some of the really great technologies that we're doing for biotech and device manufacturers, really helping to improve their efficiency, expenditure, costs, and hopefully potentially transform the patient experience. Um, so it's really been an exciting process overall. I think, as I mentioned earlier, robotics really is the future of healthcare. Um, I believed in this so much that I left my role at J&J &J to come here and help build this vision at ABB. Um, I think healthcare has never been more in the spotlight than it is right now with COVID-19. Um, and we've seen sort of the importance of robotics in this pandemic by, for example, cleaning hospitals to avoid infecting healthcare workers or delivering medicines to patients to prevent human contact and infection. So I think um, we really serve to demonstrate the importance of integrating technology into robotics and healthcare. And I think ABB is really ready to take up this charge and address the needs for the healthcare industry as a whole. Fantastic. You're right. It is all exciting. It's all great. <laughs> um, so I'd love to move on to, to Candida. So you spoke a, a bit about project management and what you're doing. And I'd love to know, what do you love the most about your work? What I love most about my work is that every day is different. Uh, every project is different. No two days are alike. Um, I can decide how much technical, uh, I, how technical I want to be in my role. Um, I have a great manager um, that I can talk to and be able to develop what motivates me most and inspires me. Um, but what I think, what I really love is the fact that even though I'm no longer in engineering design, that I'm still in engineering and I'm still using those basic fundamentals that I learned in engineering in my, in my job today every day mm -hmm. uh, and that is just a plus for me uh, another perk of the job that i love is the fact with due to the covid 19 uh, i can work anywhere there's cell phone service i can hot spot i can work i don't have to be in a factory i can be home remote uh, working and i can do my job at a hundred percent and that's what i truly love about most of my love most about my job Fantastic. And you mentioned you did, um, of course, engineering design before, and I'm wondering if you could also uh, touch on some of the, the highlights of, of your uh, career and how it, it led you to project management. Oh, definitely. You know, I, I was listening to Shraket and High Five Girl because I'm also first generation here. Uh, also first in my family to get a bachelor's degree. Uh, and so definitely applauding my other women out there uh, who also are first at, in a lot of things. Um, I received my engineering degree from the University of Houston Clear Lake, uh, computer systems engineering, which is a little bit of computer science, a little bit of uh, computer hardware, and a little bit of electrical engineering. And as I was studying uh, I had an opportunity as a contractor, I got hired with GE Arrow, working in document control. So I was at the bottom of the bottom is where I started with <laughs> GE. And uh, I have worked my way up. Uh, once I finished my degree, I got hired uh, as a requisition engineer. I worked uh, in REC for four and a half years. Uh, I worked on the largest North American project at the time, uh, which was Coolidge, Arizona. Uh, I was 12 uh, next generation LM6000 units that I'm very proud of. Uh, it, to me, that was the turning point in my career. I had an opportunity to see the project from uh, actual build to installation and commissioning. Uh, and I remember the day when I'm standing at site, standing on top of an air filter, taking it all in and being thirsty, like Shirkhead said, for more and wanting to just want more out of my career. 
So then I decided my next move is, was going to have to be design. You know, I needed to get a design role. Mm-hmm. I needed to be in front. And so I had that opportunity. I went into the design uh, role. I started working uh, as an electrical design engineer. Uh, I convinced the manager to hire me. Uh, initially, he didn't because he, I wasn't what he was looking for. And so what I told him was he needed someone diverse like me with a different perspective than the people on his team. And that I brought something different to the table that he didn't have and why he needed me. And at the end of my meeting with this, uh, with the manager, I convinced him that he offered me the job on the spot. I got the opportunity wow. to work on one of my favorite projects, uh, which was uh, the Book of Us Fast Ferry project. Um, just a little bit about this project as to why I'm very passionate about engineering is it's, uh, I started this project from conception, collaborating with my peers and moving it from conception to actual fabrication, to actual build, to actual testing of sea trials. So the Book of Us Fast Ferry is a 99 meter long ferry, which is about the size of a football field that holds a thousand people. It's a direct competitor to the airline business in Rio de Plata from Buenos Aires, Argentina to Uruguay, Montevideo. It holds 253 cars and ladies, it has the largest duty-free shop on any vessel in the world. (laughs) So it has opened the commerce between those two cities tremendously. And I had the opportunity to be able to see this from paper to actual being on the unit at sea trials, being the face of the company, everyone looking at me for answers if something happened. And for me, that was like the eye opener. I felt like I was the celebrity. Like I had made it as an engineer. I was so excited. Like I'm so excited just talking about it today, remembering that feeling I had as an engineer. And that feeling I continue today and everything I do. After that job, I got promoted to technical leader. Again, first female technical leader for Aero, which I'm very proud. Uh, and then I moved from that position to VCP, which is a variable cost productivity team, where we were tasked from a power team to move into healthcare to drive cost out. Uh, I got the tools that I needed to understand how to bring cost out, uh, and then GE laid off. So I got laid off, but I didn't take it to heart. You have to understand the dynamics of the environment that we're in. And at that time, GE was just laying off everybody. So it wasn't something I took to heart. A year later, I find a job with GE Industrial Solutions as a project manager. And that's where I am today, still using those fundamental uh, basic uh, training that I've learned throughout my different careers and still excited that I can still use my engineering knowledge in the job that I do today. Wow, that's a fantastic story. I don't wanna be cliche, but it really sounds like you follow your heart with this and that's that's so inspiring. Um, So I'd like to move on to Rena now. So I'm interested, how do you feel like your your career post-graduation has been different than how you imagined it would be as a student? and how has it met your expectations? Yeah, um, first, I just wanna say that story was so inspiring and that feeling of being on top of the world as an engineer is what I strive for. So that made me really excited (laughs) to get there hopefully one day. Um, But yeah, in terms of how my career has been different than how I imagined it, um, as I was starting to think about my career as I started college, I always knew that the field I wanted to go into was uh, was sustainability and finding ways for how I could help contribute to a more sustainable future. And the field that really attracted me within that um, was actually grid modernization and large scale integration of renewables into power grid, which I know Audrey, you're also really interested in. Um, but that field was actually the reason why I actually, I chose electrical engineering in the first place. And so, as I was kind of developing what I thought my career would be in college, I always thought that grid modernization, smart grid solutions would be the field that I would ultimately end up in and um, would grow my career in. And so 
as I started in the LEAD program, I was actually able to do a rotation with our Smart Grid Solutions group, as I said before, and it was amazing to be able to actually work on all this stuff that I was always really interested in and, and had a passion for. Um, and so that was really gratifying. But then as I kind of went into my other two rotations and got an eye for all the other things that APB was doing, my priority somewhat shifted. And I would say my priority kind of shifted from working specifically in grid modernization to instead finding ways for how we as a company can incorporate sustainability into the value that we provide to our customers. And that takes on many different forms. That can look like um, increasing energy optimization. That could be energy efficiency. It could be um, helping design electrical distribution to, uh, you know, to not need as many generators on the system, um, et cetera. So really, um, you know, as I start my new uh, role, a lot of the projects that I'm working on are actually oil and gas based, which I never thought I would be working on when I was in college. Um, but what's actually making me excited about it is, you know, even in these very non-traditionally, these fields that are not traditionally seen as sustainable, how can we increase the efficiency of their operations? How can we bring sustainability into the value add we give our customers? Um, and that I find is kind of sparking a little bit of creativity in me and, and uh, I find that really interesting. And, you know, as a business also trying to see how we uh, as a group who traditionally have, um, you know, done oil and gas projects, how can we diversify and um, offer projects and offer solutions that are more, you know, integrating renewable based and, and sustainable based. I think that's kind of um, made me really excited for this new role. So, you know, overall, in terms of if my career has met my expectations, I would say it has in that I'm still thinking about sustainability a lot. It's still at the forefront of my priorities and it's still something I can incorporate into my job every day. Um, but in terms of what that looks like and what I think that looks like, that will look like in the future has definitely changed from um, what I thought it would be in college. And so if anything, that's really just opened up a lot of doors for me as I move forward in my career um, in terms of what kinds of fields I uh, will want to work in in the future. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like it's made you realize there's even more out there than you thought there was. Yes, definitely. So I have another question for you in the spirit of International Women in Engineering Day. Why do you think it's important for us to celebrate today? Women in yeah. engineering. <laughs> yes, I'm so excited to celebrate. And I think there's two big reasons why I think it's really important to kind of recognize this day. The first reason being, um, I think us as women in the engineering workspace right now, we really want to help inspire and encourage young women that are interested in or interested in or curious about STEM fields um, to pursue it if if they're passionate about it and if and if it's something that interests them. Um, you know, the last thing I would want personally is for is for a young woman to feel like you know she's interested in STEM but doesn't know if she wants to go into it because of you know the the challenges that come with being a woman in a male dominated workplace. Um, I think, you know, as us women in the engineering space right now, we can kind of inspire and and show young women all the things that you can do um, as an engineer and all the different career paths that are available. And I think all the stories that we've heard today from from people that are very far into their careers um, are super can is very are very super are super inspiring and hopefully um, help young women feel supported and like there are resources out there for them if they choose a you know, a STEM career. And then the second reason is, I think it's also important to highlight and recognize the amazing accomplishments of women engineers and the unique strengths and perspectives that they bring um, to the engineering space and that they bring to the table. Um, and that goes for, you know, diversity as a whole. Diversity is how we get different schools of thoughts. It's how we get creative solutions. It's how we get more understanding of our customers and uh, you know, all that is true for having women in, in the engineering space. And so it's really important for us to recognize all of the things that women can bring um, in a traditionally, you know, male dominated field and, and how it only makes um, companies better and, and makes us able to uh, serve our customers even better. Great answer, I completely agree. And, and a compliment to our panelists, I, what I was thinking of when I was trying to figure out who I wanted to speak today, I was thinking who would make great role models for, for up and coming engineering students. Who do they want to hear from? Um, so I consider you all role models. I think you're great. Um, so we are about to go into our audience Q&A portion. So while you're thinking of 
um, questions and typing them into the chat box. I'm going to ask one final question to our to our panelists. So, same question for all of you. Um, what is the best piece of advice advice you've ever received? So, Sarah, we'll start with you. Okay, I think um, you know one thing I would say is take risks. I think that um, you know that's one of the things, especially as you have mentors and friends, you know, just take calculated risks, um, you know, whether it's a role, whether it's a location, whether it's joining an organization, um, you know, getting involved in a project, you know, as engineers, we're great problem solvers. So I think when you get into a situation, you know, you can assess it pretty quick, you know, you can then start putting your plans together and start working on it because you're so much smarter than I think at least I feel like I give myself credit for, and I have this conversation with my daughters all the time. I mean, it's like, take take a chance, you know, because if, if you fail, then you'll fail fast and you can do something different, but you'll always learn and grow from these experiences. Fantastic. Jamie? I would say, you know, take charge of your own development. Don't wait for a mentor or a boss to, decide, you know, how you can be developed, really take those opportunities and, and look for those opportunities on your own and, um, you know, go into your reviews and your the time you have one on one with your boss with a plan of of what you want to see for yourself and, and advocate for yourself and in, in how you want to develop and what areas you're interested in. Wonderful. Shirkat, best piece of advice? Oh, I've gotten so much great advice. Um, <laughs> I think if I had to pick two, if I can pick two. Um, yes, you can certainly pick two. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, the first I would say is quite similar to what Sarah mentioned is being, being open and taking risks. So I would say being open to new experiences and being ready to embrace change uh, is have been really critical for me in my career and uh, really allow me to learn new skills and grow and develop. I think if you're not if you're not uncomfortable, then you're not in the right place. Um, so you should always be challenging yourself um, to grow and to learn. I think the second um, is probably the best advice now that I think about it that I ever received. Um, it's to know your own power. Um, and by that, I feel like for women, oftentimes we underestimate our own abilities. Um, and sometimes we tell ourselves no and limit ourselves before other people do. So the perfect example of this is an opportunity that I was going to apply for after my postdoc. And it was me and another male postdoc in the lab. And out of the 10 skills there, I had nine and he had three of the 10 skills and I had nine and I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm really qualified for this role, you know, can I do it? And then he had three and he's like, I'm going to get it. I'm totally going to get this role. Um, so from that experience, uh, I really learned that you shouldn't tell yourself no, you should always tell yourself, yes, you can do it. Um, and then let other people tell you no, but don't put those limitations on yourself. And, you know, I went into J&J &J with that mentality and every role that I had at that company, I, with the, you know, with the support, obviously of leadership, I was able to create for myself. Um, so I think being able to know your own power and not putting limitations on yourself is, is, is probably the best advice I can give anyone. Fantastic, and it sounds similar to what Candida was telling us earlier when she um, was trying to get that that job, and she was able to convince convince the hiring manager to hire her. So, absolutely. So, Candida, what is what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? I have two as well. Um, one being uh, seek out the hardest jobs, the hardest projects those the work that nobody wants because that's the one where for me has always been the most fruitful where I've learned that it's challenged me um, it has made me a better person both personally and professionally 
And I feel it's also the one where I felt the most accomplished, where I have said, wow, I can't believe I took this project that no one wanted that was, I mean, you couldn't beg anyone to take, nobody would take it. I took it and turned it around and made it the best project out there. And those have been the projects where my managers and my peers have looked up to me and said, wow, I can't believe you did that. Uh, I, I don't like to, to take the easy things. Um, so I'm always looking for that. Uh, and the other second piece of advice is build your network. Networking is so important. If you're still in school, go join IEEE, go join all of the affinities there at your local school, uh, whether you're in high school or college, uh, join them because those are the people that are gonna help you find your next role. I would not have been in this role where I am today if it wasn't for my networking and me saying, I need help. Where in my network can I find the next role for me? Because at the time when GE was laying off, I wasn't the only one being laid off. The market was flooded. There was a lot of people looking for work. Um, and I started reaching out to my network. And I had a dear friend in California who said, hey, I have a job for you. Let me talk to my manager because you would be perfect for this role. And that's how I was able to get my foot in the door, being able to get somebody inside to put two, you know, two or three sentences down for you to be able to say, hey, I, I vouch for this person and feel that this person would be great for this job. You know, my resume can be awesome, but it's very hard to, for someone, a hiring manager to see a resume. They are looking at resumes in and out, sometimes looking at thousands of resumes and they have to pick two or three or maybe 20 that they're going to interview. They can't interview everyone. And how do you stand out? And to me, that was one of the most important things that I really feel um, is that advice that I could give someone is to build that network, get your name out there, let everyone know what you can do and your say-do ratio. That's, that's important. Fantastic. And finally, Rena, best piece of advice you've ever received. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'll keep it short because I know we have a lot of questions, but um, I'd say my best piece of advice is probably from my mom, um, which has been kind of helpful as I begin my career, which is uh, think big, act small. Um, I think as I've kind of started and now that I'm getting a grip of the business, there's all these really big ideas that, that come to your mind and things you want to see changed and and you know directions that you want the company to go in and, and so on and so forth. But I think it's really important to, to think all those big things, but then be able to drill it down into the details, get into the weeds a little bit and figure out how can I act in, in a small manner to, to, in order to create that kind of monumental change. Um, because you know, I think all of those, all those small actions ultimately will, will lead to the change and, and the direction that you want the company to go in. Um, but for me, it's been really helpful to kind of be able to have big picture, but also be able to drill down into details um, as I kind of have started thinking about all of that. Sure, sure. Like manageable steps. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So time for our audience questions. We've got many, many questions in the chat. The first one will be for Shirkett. You mentioned you made a decision in eighth grade to attend a high school focused on medicine. What mentors, experiences, et cetera, exposed you to the healthcare field to drive a passion at such a young age? Yeah, so I would think it was a it was a more about the experiences that I had. So for example, um, a lot of the field trips to the science museums, um, really engagement with science teachers. I always did well in science class. So I would spend time after school talking to science teachers and doing like little simple experiments within their classrooms. Um, and then also summer camps and internships. I think um, I'm one of those people who learn through experiences. So most of my career choices have been me getting an actual experience and learning if I love it or not. 
I would say mentors are critical as well. I um, have mentors not only uh, from from eighth grade, but also throughout my entire career. Um, and I keep in contact with those mentors. I think no matter at what stage you are within your career, you always need a mentor. Um, and you always need mentors at different levels. Um, your peers can be a mentor, but also uh, within different fields, as well as sort of levels above you as well. Um, those different perspectives have been useful for me um, to sort of drive me toward where I am today. Wonderful. Um, so this next question can be to anyone. Uh, how, how do you think companies can best support uh, female engineers as they progress through their careers what are some barriers that exist or supports that are missing at work today? This is Candida. Um, I'll take, oh, I'll take that Great. one. I think some good support, you know, kind of like, you know, I come from the GE world into ABB and ABB now developing the Encompass teams and that being a, a good place to build a network of support of people who are like-minded or interested in the same type of uh, topics. Uh, I think that's a, a good thing that the company is doing to be able to support that. Um, and I think also with like, I don't know about barriers, but I think what we do need to do more is highlight the accomplishments of women in the industry, um, possibly doing some type of like uh, women engineer award uh, type thing. I know when I was in, in, in the technology field, uh, we did that on a yearly basis where we always uh, within the year had, uh, and it was always the same day every year, we knew that February was engineering month and February is when we celebrated uh, engineers across the organization. Uh, and we did many activities focused on engineering and learning uh, with STEM, with the, the students and in elementary all the way up to college. Uh, we interacted with them, brought them in, did a lot with robotics, mentoring and stuff to also uh, highlight uh, the different aspects of engineering uh, within those uh, fields. And I, I think that doing more of highlighting the, the great accomplishments that the, the female engineer has done and highlighting it, I think would be great. And I'd like to add something. I agree with you. Yeah. Oh, sure. Go for there it. too, Audrey. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I took some time off to stay home with my kids between being an application engineer and going into product marketing and I know that ABB has an initiative right now to help women return to the workforce. And I, I think that's a really a great thing for people who do take some time out and companies can really support women by really trying to help them get back into the workforce. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a question, an interesting question. Um, do you have any advice on how to bridge over to more of an engineering role without a traditional engineering background? So maybe Shirket, if you want to take this one. Yeah, so um, I would say through small projects at work. So when I was at j and I originally came in as a scientist, a senior scientist. Um, but I wanted to learn more about the business aspects of things. Uh, so. Um, through projects that we had within the company, um, I learned more and more. So by taking on small projects where you get exposure to regulatory or taking on small projects where you get exposure to commercialization and some of the, uh, the, the end product development, as well as sort of how do we design a clinical study. Through these projects, I was able to develop my skills to the point where I was basically leading something that I created within the company, which is called the Disruptive Innovation Accelerator. So really taking all of the skills I learned from different projects and putting them into one need to basically assess all of our external licensing opportunities from a technical aspect, from a methodology aspect, from clinical studies, making sure we design clinical studies properly and test them and validate technologies even from a regulatory uh, IP and business perspective as well. Um, so I took all of the learnings that I learned through projects 
um, and then basically created all of those into a role where I saw a gap within the company for myself. Great. Great. Um, another question to anyone, can you share some advice on ensuring a healthy work-life balance? Uh, this is Sarah. I think, you know, what I'd say is I think work-life balance is a challenge for everyone. You know, not, I'd say, not even just women. Um, you know, I, mm -hmm. I think there's not always a one-size-fits-all. Like, it's never a 50-50 split every week, right? I mean, some weeks I feel like I'm a better mom and a better wife, and some weeks I think I'm a better business leader, you know, but you can't beat yourself up about it because I just think that there's, you know, in today's society, you know, there's just always so much going on. But what I try to do is, you know, I try to put things on the calendar. So we have a personal calendar at home. I put when I'm traveling for work on there so that people will know. And, you know, on my work calendar, I try to put when there's big activities, you know, that are personal that I want to try to attend. And I just try to make it work between the two. Um, but I think just have an open communication, you know, especially with my family and, you know, with my coworkers, if there's, you know, if I need to step out for something or, you know, if I have to attend something, you know, then you just have to kind of figure out how to make it up. Um, you know, I tend to get up very early because my family doesn't, my kids don't start moving until like 10 o'clock in the morning, it seems. So, you know, like I try to catch up on a lot of things early and then, you know, once they're up, I just try to spend time with them. So, um, I think you have to, it, it's a balance, right? It's not an easy answer, but you just have to try a couple different things and see and see what works for you and your family. Makes sense. Anyone else want to take that one? All right, then I'll move on to the next question. Um, this one is pretty interesting. Um, so we tend to see a lot of um, women, young women in AP classes in high school, and then a lot of them in the intro to engineering courses, those first year courses, and then it kind of slowly diminishes as you get towards graduation, and then it just keeps going, getting smaller and smaller. Any ideas on why that might be, and any solutions? <laughs> Maybe I'm going to pick on Rena. Any? Yeah, I was since you've gonna... recently gone through <laughs> education, what yes. are your perspectives? <laughs> um, I first of all, I can relate to that question. Um, I would say when I was in high school, um, that definitely happened to me. By the my senior year of high school, I was in this AP Physics C class, and it was ten kids, and I was the only girl in it. Um, and so it was just kind of got weeded out more and more. Um. And so it is challenging, I'd say. I mean, when you're the only woman and woman or girl in a in a classroom full of men, I think it can be intimidating. Um, but at, in terms of how to combat that, I think you know it's up to the it's also you know the teachers have to encourage the the girls to go out for those classes to not feel like they're inadequate in any way. And then and then it's also up to you know us again as as people that have gone through it to to encourage the young women and say, hey, like, you're good enough for this. You are, you're as smart as all those other boys in that class. And, you know, you, you know, are, you fit in inside that um, space, even though you might not look like everyone else in there. Um, I think, you know, we have to keep encouraging them and, and telling them that, uh, you know, they, if they're interested and they're passionate about those kinds of sciences, then, then they should go for it, uh, regardless of, you know, who's in the class and whatnot. Um, so, sure. yeah, and if you are in that position, then just keep persevering through it. That's all I can say. <laughs> you are enough. You yeah, are good enough to be there for sure. Um, so don't let yourself yeah. doubt, that, doubt that fact. Yeah, and I'll add something as well. I do think it starts way earlier than high school because by the time it's high school, as you said, you're the only girl in your in your physics class and it was the same way for me. I think it starts way earlier and um, some things that ABB has done, ABB sponsors FIRST, um, which is a international organization that sponsors um, robotics clubs and competitions uh, for elementary, middle and high school kids. And it's, they really emphasize diversity and trying to get um, everyone interested in technology. We also sponsor Girl Scouts, um, and 
we're part of the Society of Women Engineers, which many of you are probably familiar. It is a professional organization, um, but there's a, a part of SWE that really focuses on outreach um, to, to K through 12 students. All right. I think those are all of our questions. Um, Five more minutes. Or here's one more question. If anyone has any last questions, now's the time to type it in. Um, so any advice for someone, a young, young professional person, someone who's just started um, working full time? What was the question? It, oh, sorry. It was, is there any particular piece of advice for a young professional, someone who's just started working full time and maybe they just joined ADB? It's Sarah. I think, you know, we mentioned this a little bit, you know, kind of throughout is just try to learn as much as you can because, you know, just you know, because where you are, you know, the role you're in, you'll, you'll only learn a certain part about the business, or maybe you'll find out that you're more interested in, you know, another group or another role, or you can add value to a different project. And so I think just, you know, learning as much as you can, developing your network, um, and, you know, and, and then you'll be able to, you know, really kind of see from a career perspective, you know, where you might want to go next. That's great. All right, um, I don't see any more questions coming into the chat. So with that, I guess we'll end a couple minutes early. Um, but I wanna say thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thanks for sharing your stories and, and your energy and motivation. It's, it's so inspiring to hear, um, to hear all of that, everything that was just shared. Um, thank you to everyone who joined, everyone in our audience. I'm so glad that you could be a part of this and celebrate with us. And of course, thank you to Anna, who's running our, our 